Okay, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to another edition of our Aftermarket Champions podcast. Uh, I'm Vivek Joshi, your host and CEO of Entitle, and I'm pleased to welcome our latest guest today, Bella Abram from Baker Hughes Bentley, Nevada. Bella joins us from our home base in Madrid, Spain, uh, where she's based uh, while working for the company. Uh, we've known Bella for about three or four years at Entitle, and we've just grown to admire how she's made a career progression uh, from a sales to service to now back to sales again. And I'd like to listen to her story. I'd like us to listen to what she's done so far in her career and the, the path ahead. And with that, uh, welcome, Bella. Thank you, Vicky Pack. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for the invite. I'm uh, looking forward to this conversation because we've tracked your progress for the last couple of years uh, or two, three years since we've been working together. And it's been quite an interesting story. So maybe, Bella, what I always like to do is maybe give you uh, some time, like a 30 seconds, a minute, if you don't mind, just introducing yourself you know, where you're from, what you studied, and kind of how you wound up uh, at Baker Hughes Bentley, Nevada. That'll be great. Sure. Um, well, I am an electrical engineer by background. I'm from Brazil, and that's where I started to my, my career. I actually started in product development in, in the automotive industry, ah. went to manufacturing, and then I, I transitioned to the energy field in Baker Hughes. Um, I was doing a, a leadership program, commercial leadership program, so did different areas and different countries um, in in Baker Hughes. And right after I, I ended the, the program, I moved to Spain, where I'm in right now, to assume the install-based growth leader position globally. Um, and that's where that's when we met. That's when I implemented Entitle as the um, our main solution for install-based management and insights generation. Um, and recently, a couple of days ago, I just moved to the growth sales manager position in, in Europe as well, covering uh, different countries across the, the continent. And now I'm using a lot the tool that I, I led the implementation. So it's, it's a pretty nice um I, I like it a lot, the, the progression and how every dot connect in the end, right? Well, actually, that's an interesting progression, right? So you're now kind of back to the sales role that you started in the commercial development. Now, you mentioned that you lived in various countries as part of the commercial development program role, the leadership program role. Where all did you live besides Brazil and Spain? Did you go to other countries as well? Yeah, so I, I worked with the uh, North America team in the U.S. In, based okay. in Houston. Um, and as sales operations, uh, so I was working with improving the tools that we have, setting the targets, analyzing performance. Then I moved to Milan to work mm. what, with the region that we called, that we used to call WeArc, that was Europe, Africa, Russia, and Caspian, um, to work in, with enterprise accounts. Mm. Uh, so putting together corporate deals with global accounts across the, the world. And then I moved to, to Spain. So it was a, in the end, like, because I was assumed a global role, it, it, it was, it worked very well that I had been in three different regions right. and had connections in all of them, right. To have this full view. So how did you wind up from the sales roles that you did? both North America, Italy, and then a little bit in uh, Brazil as well, into a services-oriented role, right? If you think of it install base, a lot of it is about services. How did that transition? How did that come about? Yeah. Um, so the right when I finished uh, the, when I graduated the program, we were doing a, an organization restructuring, and <laughs> the, the role was actually created. That wasn't the role before. Interesting. Um, and we all knew the. it was mostly about generating insights from the data that we had with our customers and be, being able to do the aftermarket, to grow the aftermarket based on that data. And we all knew, I, I myself knew that the data was, had very many challenges on the, the quality perspective. Uh, because when I was doing the corporate agreements, I, I needed the data and I couldn't get it. So we did tons of assumptions to be able to do the, the contracts and to, to agree on the terms. Um, and in the same time, I had a, a very good sense and, and I was very astute 
in the the tools that we use because of the sales ops role right. that I did in North America. Right. So I think it was the perfect combination uh, to think that okay, this is a, a big challenge, but it, it's something I I'm interested in, and mm. also being a global role and being in the um, in a leadership position, right? It brings a lot of visibility. And of course, it's an area that has a lot to improve on. And if mm -hmm. we do improve on, there is a lot of impact that we can do with it. So it was a big opportunity for me to leverage for my career as well. So that's how I, I got there. <laughs> that's pretty good. And so you wound up, if I remember correctly, you wound up in the broader global sales organization, even though you were responsible for making sure that these, each sales team, each sales organization within each geography or region was making the most of the value of the install base, be it for service, training, all kinds of other things. What what were the things that you guys were trying to grow? I mean, is it just uh, add-on sales? Is it service sales? All of the above? What was it that you were trying to grow as part of this uh, this install base initiative that you did? Um. So the, the initiative itself, it started with services um, and they were trying to grow to services orders. And and also they were doing some data improvements on their side, in the sites and so on. But we saw the potential of the tool to be, a, and that was much smaller opportunities, transactional mm -hmm. services that we could mm -hmm. do because of uh, small insights that we would have with the data. But once we started working with it, we realized how much more strategic it could be. Because if, if we have a good data and a good visualization of the data, we can actually take business decisions on products, on, on markets to go, um, on the phases of, of the growth itself. So when I started, um, I think it was much more on the transactional side, on mm -hmm. services. Mm -hmm. And now we are using much more on a, where we want to grow in terms of new solutions that we have as well, where it makes sense for us to grow. And we are driving much more global campaigns to try to uh, make everyone grow in the strategic pillars that we have, much more than on a regional transactional basis. I'd say. Mm -hmm. Well, it's interesting, right? What you said is that in some ways, the transition from being a service-oriented uh, initiative to a broader growth initiative was really how it came about. And I think you said something interesting that almost all of our customers tell us is that once you have the data in front of you, all kinds of things become apparent that weren't there until you put the data together. Is that kind of what is going on in the organization between you and the global sales uh, leader and everything like that as well? It, uh, yes and no. I think everyone knew we had a gold mine because we have over 60 years of, of yeah. expertise, of, of history. And we know our install base is huge. Uh, and we, we, ha we are a strong brand in the market as well. So everyone always wanted to see that data. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but mm -hmm. it was so scattered around that we couldn't do anything with the data and it was so frustrating and we, we mm -hmm. wanted to do that many, many times and we failed back in the past. So I think now that I'd say a lot with the help of Entitle as well, um, we, we now can show where before we used to have like 30% of visibility. Now we are almost 90%. That's so amazing. Yeah, it, it, so now we are actually active on, with the product team saying, no, let's grow in that market. Let mm. this These guys cannot handle this tool right now because they have another requirement that mm -hmm. before we had no voice. Mm. We just interviewed some customers, but we really couldn't mine the data like we are doing right now. Now it's really data-driven intelligence, right? I mean, to some degree, you're now smarter about what you can do, what the company should do uh, collectively. And it's interesting you said what you did, right? So one of the one of the points of view that I'm telling people is like, look, fundamentally, install-based selling or install-based intelligence is a team game. You need to have the engineers in there. You need to have product in there. You need to have salespeople in there. You need to have service people in there. You need to have marketing people in there all looking at the same data, arriving at a common view and common truth about what needs to get done. It sounds like that's what's going on, certainly with the product people and the salespeople, at least, to start building that out. Has that started creating a change in how people think about this stuff at uh, Baker Hughes Bentley? 
A hundred percent. I think in the beginning I had contact with services and that was it. And then we start growing, right? Then, okay, product needs, needs some data. And someone told them that the install base leader has the data. So they come to me and then someone told marketing that they have the, the contacts as well. And now like we are all being fed from the same database and that's the super important if we want to be a data driven company if we want to be smart about what we're doing right so yes you know the question for you is which is kind of if you think about what you just said you you now have all these people wanting to look at data you want to be a data driven company but you and i both know that a lot of this stuff requires a change in mindset right i mean look uh, i've been around industry for a long time just like you and your peers this stuff is hard in the sense that you're trying to take people who weren't used to or didn't rely on data to tell them to say, no, 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 start looking at this stuff carefully. Because even though there may be some data quality issues, the fundamental insights are still valid. Figure out how to use them. How, how has that changed been? Because you have a big global organization and it's not, I can't imagine it's easy to make this change happen, no? No, it's definitely not easy. I. I'd say the early adopters and the people that uh, were more exciting with were excited with the from the beginning were the new people. <laughs> the the new the less time they had in the company, the more data they wanted. Uh, the ones that have been here for ten years plus, they are like, I know my customer, I know what they do, I don't care, <laughs> but yeah. you have to show me. Um, yeah. and we need to be very. Uh, I think. There was a big work that we've done trying to filter out the insights and right. trying to give the very best for them right. to have a very good conversion rate right. and to prove them that they can actually get something out of it. Um, and of course, sharing the success stories, right? It's super powerful. So, okay, no one wants to see it, but if a new guy comes mm-hmm. and he sees a super uh, valuable insight, and he makes a big order out of it, maybe the, the old guys will start looking at it. So it's a lot about changing change management as well, yeah. communication, and and of course, having strong sponsors um, in the company, having it tied to the strategy of the company. This all, this all tied together in the end. Yeah. You know, there's something that you said a few minutes ago about the people who use it and show wins and you can demonstrate those wins to the people who aren't using or who are resistant to the change. You know, there's a, a slightly different uh, question regarding that as well, right? So when I look at those people who are winning, they think differently, they act differently. Are there, I, uh, and this is maybe a difficult question for you to answer very suddenly, but are, are there something about attributes about those people who use data and win versus those who don't, right? So I call it the champion mindset versus not, right? I mean, do you see those differences in those people based on obvious performance metrics? Is there something about the mindset that makes them different? Um, it's a difficult I, question, I know, because you're you're looking across the entire global team, but mm-hmm. I'm trying to pick what's what's common there. Uh, I, I think it's, it's a combination of things. I'd say first, to, to be a data-driven person, it, it means that you you want to investigate, you want to see the facts and, and do different than what you were doing if the data tells you to do so, right? So it, it's about being open, I'd say. Um, and because of our history of data that wasn't cleaned, of everything, many of the people, they were not open because they don't right. want to, to, to lose, waste time um, on, on doing this investigation. Um, and besides that, it's also about being strategic, really, and, and both in your job and understanding how your job fits into the, the bigger picture, right? Mm-hmm. So uh, the, if, if we are communicating that install base is part of the strategy of the company, and we are being clear about why it's part of the strategy and why we are doing it and how mm-hmm. we can bring more to you. I think the champions, they they understand, they make sure they understand it and they apply it to their routine as well. 
You know, it's interesting what you said, because one of the things I always tell people, this change requires a few things. And one is curiosity and openness, like you said. Two is willingness to try something, right? Openness is one thing, but saying, I'm trying something. And then the third part is having some notion of strategic or critical thinking to understand how this picture fits together, right? And that's really important because I see that time and time again, where people kind of have that have that difficulty making that transition to kind of applying that because they're too used to their usual way of doing things and they just stop doing things on a regular basis. So that's actually an interesting thing, right? So now when I, when I ask you something, I don't need to know exact numbers because again, this is, you know, I want you to keep certain data private, but I think you had like three, 400 people around the world, if I remember correctly, some large number yeah. like that. Uh, mm -hmm. There were clearly pockets of excellence in each of them. Um, when you think about the pockets of excellence, people who, who'd use the data succeeded in one, were you able to see a clear difference in what I would call performance level of those folks versus those who weren't using it? You know what I'm saying? Because the idea was to kind of make you a better salesperson, make you a better service salesperson, whatever it could be. Was there, a, again, this this is probably difficult for you to answer with, without data, but was there a clear performance difference in these people? If you look at how much they closed, what the yields were, so on and so forth. <clears throat> um, it's it's hard to say that because I, I can see for sure that the ones that used were high performers, um, but the ones that didn't use many times they had already big projects going on. Oh, I see, I see. Okay. Um, so it, it also makes sense, like yeah. if they already have a way to close their target, yeah. uh, they won't be curious or right. dedicate so much time yeah. to investigate on it. So yeah. I think that's a way to find the spots where you you want to, where you have right. more potential to have better engagement too. Like what Correct. are the people that are needing the most? So you can develop and, and work with them to develop more success cases, right? Now, one more thing for you. You said something interesting a few minutes ago that you found the difference between newer employees versus people who've been around for a while. One thing one of your colleagues had said to me one day was that, you say, Vivek, I didn't realize this, but this is actually a, a very interesting way to train and onboard new people. Because in the old days, we had to say, go talk to him, go talk to her, get this data, get that. Versus now you have everything in one place in one install based system. Did that, did that, did you see that be, uh, benefit as well in terms of being able to train your global team better, faster? A hundred percent. Yeah. We, we used to have excel base install base you know like and someone had an excel and when i started in the role i started gathering all the data i could to understand how to to put it all together and there was always someone oh that was this guy that mapped the install <laughs> base in this country back in 2020 you know like right. back in 2018 and that's how they passed the the message away and every time we had a new sales manager they would do the full discovery with the customer from scratch, you know? And now every time we have a new sales manager uh, rolling, uh, like starting, they they ask for access in Entitle even before they have a territory, you know? Like sometimes we still don't give, didn't give the access because the territory hasn't been updated yet, but they already want to understand their, their customer base. So they have this this visibility and it's so much smarter, right? So, yeah. so you know, I'm going to kind of ask you a question kind of going back a few minutes ago, right in the beginning when you were telling us your story, right? So you came to the Commercial Leadership Development Program where it's a training program for young graduates or new graduates to kind of get into things. Uh, why, as an engineer, you said you did some work in automotive, but why as an engineer you came into sales? What was it? What is the thought process where you come into sales and then into, you know, into this notion of uh, customer? And I'd love to understand more about how that transition has worked for you as well. Yeah. Uh, well, when I moved to, to sales, I was in the manufacturing, in supply chain, working as a process engineer. Um, and I was doing a lot of continuous improvement, improvements on the, on the lines of production lines and so on. Um, which was very rewarding to see the results, but it was very limited to the site, what mm -hmm. the impact I would have in that plant. Um, and coming to sales now, it was a lot about the, the glo having the global view, the global perspective. Uh, but now I think the impact of the projects that I 
implement are so much bigger. Um, I can see it translated into orders, but also into like defining or helping at least supporting the definition of the new product mm. uh, strategy or a new solution that we are developing and, and analyzing the concept overall. So I think I, I think the, the engineer side of me is still um, exercised a lot because we are talking about very specific solutions mm -hmm. um, for the energy field and for different industries as well. But the strategic side and, and the, the part that a little bit about vanity as well, right? That that wants to see the impact you're 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 getting to. Mm -hmm. I think it's so much reward more rewarding in, in sales in in the commercial picture. Right. And that's why I came. <laughs> so when you when you moved out of CLP program into the what I would call the chief install base officer role, right, for Benson mm -hmm. Nevada. That is a big deal for a new and career person. How did that change how you think about stuff? How did it change in terms of your progression? Because clearly you were given a chance to sit at the table with some pretty senior people, mm -hmm. right? And kind of drive a very big, visible global initiative. That doesn't happen to everybody. How, yes. how did that change how, your career, how you think about your career? And more importantly, how does you know, your, your bosses think about your career, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it wasn't... It was an unusual move for people graduating to the program. Um, it was, back, back then it was a huge pressure, especially because it was to do a, a job that no one wanted to because the, the data was pretty hard to, yeah, to deal with. Yeah, yeah. But uh, I knew the potential that it had and it, it ended up having, right? Like that yeah. we increased 10 times what we used to do with the initiative right. in the beginning. Um, and it gave me for sure, like the, the visibility I have on the company strategy. I had the, the chance to have product training with the mm -hmm. product leaders of each each part of the business in the in our headquarters mm -hmm. um, in go to the manufacturing learn from the the supply chain leader what what is there and get these connections um, the this network and in the end like the the next step I, I ended up in an, another leadership program that we have in the company mm -hmm. more of a mid career one that I just graduated mm -hmm. right now too yeah, in nice. a very short set of time so it was like two years and I already got to a new one. Um, and the, like within that program, I defined it. Okay. I want to do uh, sales. I want to go to the, the customer and, and now work to grow the orders that I know we can do because of this visibility right. I had. Right. And I have all this background and I, I had the connections to work on this next step of the career. And I think it's, I, I feel like my my career path is very is much more structured now and I have this possibility because I was right. in a very senior role maybe a little earlier in my career. Right. Yeah. Well it's interesting and, and more importantly in, in addition to the senior role early in the career, you were able to get a as we say in the US a bird's eye view of the entire business and what's happening. Mm -hmm. And in that context, obviously I have a bias towards services and aftermarket. You know, and you mentioned something interesting early on, but what 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 was the learning you had at the broader level, at the, at the higher level, about the role of services in the context of a company like a Bentley Nevada or any of the manufacturer? How does that how does that come to you as a based on what you've learned in the last few years? Um, I think services was also always a very big focus for Bentley Nevada since the, the very beginning. And we are very strong on the expertise we have with our services team. Um, so it was always central in our strategy. Mm -hmm. uh, right now, we are transforming ourselves, right? We are acquiring uh, new companies or doing mm -hmm. partnerships, developing AI powered solutions. And the as a service is each time it's bigger, right? Mm -hmm, the, mm -hmm. the subscription and making everything become services. Even mm -hmm. if we provide the software, is it through subscription? Mm -hmm. Is and then we're gonna uh, show the services. So uh, we are going 
like what I believe every single industry in the world we are living in right now is going to in, in, in a model that if it's not your core, your expertise, don't worry, leave it with them, with, mm -hmm. with us, mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. we know how to do it. Mm -hmm. um, and in this world, I think install base is so important. And I let's say customer experience, customer success, all this, different roles and, and perspectives of the same focus, it, they are so important and we realize it and we are doing a lot of, of investment on it because yeah. of because it's so strategic. And I think that's the thing that's what I find interesting is as the journey that you describe in the early days from, look, this is just data to, holy cow, this is not just services, but more than services about relationships with the customer, understanding what the product roadmap looks like and bringing that back and getting all the other functions involved is really the strategic aspect of services people forget. You know, when I was in a role in marketing and services, I used to tell my uh, manufacturing or product people and the sales people, I said, look, services is your best friend in knowing what's going on with a customer. And you ought to be paying attention to your service people because they learn more about stuff going on than you would ever learn from a conversation with some senior person, right? Mm -hmm. And so the ability to take that information kind of portrayed to everybody and now, with the advent of you know more and more AI related stuff going on, it's actually amazing how much you can process there, right? So I think that's the part that's actually interesting. I, I get excited by just thinking about the kinds of things that are available to companies like Bentley Nevada, the whole collection of data that you have and information that you have in terms of being able to do it. Yes, definitely. When you when you think about your career, since this, some of this is about career growth as well, you know. What advice, so two questions, where do you see next in terms of, you know, obviously you've just taken this role as a, uh, a global account, uh, a growth a growth account, uh, gr account growth leader, I think, right? Uh, and I don't exact title, maybe you can t tell that. What, what's the kind of progression you see for yourself getting out of this uh, role for the next few years? Uh, well, I just, uh, I just started <laughs> just, in the yes. role for sure. Yeah. Um, I, I, I really like, as I said, I really like the commercial uh, team. Uh, what I, and I really like the, the, the area that we are in, the energy field, the rotating equipment hmm. uh, field. So what I intend to do is learn a lot from our customers and, and get to, um, to, to be a, a regional leader. Hmm. Um, maybe from, from services, from sales, but I think having this field, um, experience will really bring, valuable. will enrich even more in my, yeah. my background, right? Yeah. Together Absolutely. with the strategic side and, and so on. And that's where I see myself. Mm -hmm. Look, having been through a lot of different roles in my life, I can tell you that sales is really hard, right? Because mm -hmm. it's trying to convince somebody to take a risk on buying something from you where they didn't know or whatever it might be. Yes, you have the brand of Baker Hughes behind you, but at some level, it's a really hard job. So this is a great training ground being in the field and being in what I would call real life. Uh, you know, you've been to CLP, maybe you've been through some XLP or whatever it might be, you know, the accelerated program we just talked about. What advice do you have maybe to give somebody who's like five years ago, right? Uh, the new graduates coming out, uh, what, what would you tell them in terms of advice uh, as a look at your progression like, man, I want to be like her. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so there is this, this quote I, I really like that it says, uh, I don't know who said it, but um, that you need to work very hard to get a little bit of luck, right? I think um, the having the growth mindset and wanting to learn more is the main thing to have a, a, and of course performance that tied with performance but is is the main thing to have a, a career progression and mm -hmm. maybe it's not very um not very intuitive the next step that you're doing but if it makes sense in terms of personal growth go for it mm -hmm. and i'd say from my personal standpoint i think i've done a lot of different things but when it came to being the, the install base leader, I think I, I didn't doubt it because mm -hmm. it was right where I wanted, how I wanted. And I only got there because I've done all those different things and I did all these different connections. So 
some people have it very clear in their minds mm -hmm. what they want to do, like what's the end point. I'm not one of those people, <laughs> um, but I know what are the types of challenges that, that motivates me and that challenges themselves, they motivate me. So I don't want to stand still. And, yep. and, and that's how I think I got the, this progression. And that's how I plan to, to continue being because yeah. I just think that life is more interesting. <laughs> yeah, like no, this. I think that's, I think what you said is important because I think sometimes people get too, too programmatically planned. If you may, this is the five things I want to do versus saying, look, I know I can make an impact. I can learn a lot. I can grow a lot. Let me go do this. And I always as I tell people in the early in my career as well, like, look, take the right job with the right people because everything else follows after that money promotions everything else follows after that because if you do the right job with the right people you will get recognized if you do it well and those things just open up doors for you we're just like you know your the doors opening for you in terms of your career progression with this you know uh, growth leader role and all these different things you're doing you know i always like and you i always like to end with a question that i you know i listen to podcasts myself you know there's a, guy, a podcast by a guy called guy raz about how i built this he always asks these people in interviews at the end, like, you know, if you look at a career, you know, how much do you ascribe to luck versus how much to your own, you know, skills and experiences and intellect? I always like to ask people the same question, like, you know, how much do you think where you are is luck versus uh, what all the engineered activities you did to get there? Mm -hmm. uh, I think there there is a bit of luck, but but because opportunities they happen every time yeah. somewhere they are happening yeah. if you work enough and if you do the right connections and and develop yourself at some point you're gonna be in the right place on the right time and you're gonna attribute that to luck but that's because you had all the <laughs> the right. other stuff right that's so right. that's how i think about it uh, that's good. I think that's exactly right. It's a balance. It's it's you have to do the right things to do to get in the place where luck happens to you. But mm -hmm. when luck happens, you got to grab it and go with it. So that's a good thing. Definitely. Yeah. Well, uh, Bella, this has been a fantastic conversation. I think it's always great to learn about different things, how people come about their career, what they do, how they think about services, install base, all these things that are so near and dear, not just to my heart, but a lot of people we talk to. So having your experience is really helpful. I think just getting your story has been actually fascinating. And so really appreciate you taking the time today to spend a few minutes with us and tell us your story. So thank you for that. And thank uh, you very much. Good luck with the new job. And we're looking forward to reading and hearing more about your successes. Sounds great. Thank you so much. Very big pleasure to be here. Awesome. Talk thank soon. you. Mm -hmm.